they have moved me to a marvelous room that has a view of the Egg Harbor Bay and the Atlantic City skyline. And my heart is full. My heart is full of the tragedy. Please, understand with me the tragedy. Okay, none of us have had true, wonderful family freedom party ecclesia. None of us. Nobody, nobody that I know has had regular outpouring of honesty and cleansing of the conscience. Nobody. The early disciples of Yeshua had a completely different way and reason of gathering. They came together to cleanse their consciences to keep their consciences pure and to even monitor the demons that remain. In the scripture, it says the demons get more tricky. The demons get more tricky after you're saved. They get into a spiritual costume. I've seen it. I've seen it. People who were violent and prideful in the world end up being violent and prideful towards other disciples. I mean, if you look at the former covenant, the, for, the former covenant has this reality of capital punishment. Now, capital punishment is nothing. If a, if a person is stoned to death, it just means they're put, being put to sleep, awaiting the evaluation. Just because a person is stoned to death does not mean that they are, their soul is lost. It just means that in the society, everyone is getting an example that this is a dangerous thing that a person is doing under the power of unclean spirits. People were not designed to do any kind of negativity or evil. People were not designed to do any kind of negativity or evil. The Garden of Eden, I used to think that that was like an interesting, weird fairy tale but it's not. You were actually designed to live a life with no pain and no death. No physical death. But then the, the death of innocence came through the invasion by a spirit. And the reality of life is this. You're surrounded by a satanic focus on salvation and joining a club that says, I know God and God is my friend. But then it's a system that's tricking you into not doing the most important thing, which is being really clear about what unclean spirits or weaknesses or nasty things remain after your salvation. That's the most important thing. That's what unifies us and brings us together. Hi, if I'm weak in this area, then I need your help. And I need to continually talk about the area where I'm weak. And as we form together, we become the amazing organism that rescues other people out of hell and hatred and, 
and ugliness and allows them to get filled with the spirit. I mean, it's such a tragedy. My life, I was conceived by two parents who were extremely sexually promiscuous. Look at that, the sky is starting to lighten. This is really cool. I was conceived by two people that were extremely sexually promiscuous. Neither of them ever had honesty times. No one ever called them into communion in a home saying, okay, is anything weird or crazy or wrong going on? Don't even worry about it. Just throw it down. We're human beings and we're surrounded by troubling and enticing spirits. And we have fleshly desires and weaknesses. And we have been invaded by many troubling spirits. So we need to keep an eye on each other and not worry. Because Christ has overcome all of our sins and troubles. But the monitoring and caring, that is the purpose of Ecclesia, to come together and admit the areas where we're just not very good to each other in a cheerful way. 2 Corinthians 12 is so important. So important. Here's this super rabbi guy the super rabbi, the scribe, the, the one that knows the scriptures. Okay? Jesus, look at the picture. Jesus picks out a bunch of commercial fishermen. These people are not necessarily super holy types. They're hard working, working stiffs. They're, you know, they're tough people. And he picks them out one by one because he can tell, he can select ones whose hearts he knows, whose hearts are going to be a foundation that can be built on. He knows hearts that foundations can be built on. So he gathers these 12, you know, Ordinary working guys. They're not going to be guys who like are totally, you know, righteous, holy, etc., etc., etc. They're just they're they're strong. They're gutsy. They can take a stand. And then, after he does his job, the crucifixion job, and resurrects and goes back into the spirit realm. This is amazing. After he goes back into the spirit realm, then he apprehends this guy who's a super Jew, who's jealous because the Christians are getting, you know, the Jesus disciples, the Messiah disciples, the disciples of the supernatural, wonderful visitor, the Messiah disciples, are getting more converts and he's angry and he wants to kill them and he's killing them. He's killing the little people that are carrying, you know, the truth of God, the peace of God. And he is arrested, grabbed by Yeshua and the angels. Can't wait to see what the angels have been doing. There's a lot of activity going on around you right now. There are spiritual battles going on right now. Battles, battles going on between angels of light and darkness. And there are territorial spirits standing over the men, standing over the women, standing over the children. Territorial spirits trying to control, control, pressing in the evil. This is a battle. We're in a war. 
But the joyful thing is the war is already won. And we're doing the mopping up. But the problem is, you and I have not been raised with honesty about all the cool stuff. I mean, when I read Leviticus 15 the first time, I was like, wow. If these rules were, had been in my house, I would not have been stuck on masturbating and, and self-pleasuring as a, as a comfort. I was scared. I was scared because my parents were hiding something. I didn't even know it. The whole story of my life was hidden and it was a beautiful story. There's all this fear and shame about talking about the ordinary functions of the body. I mean, I celebrate. People think I'm nuts. I celebrate the scientific discovery of the clitoris. The woman has a big erectile tissue on the inside. It's a big stiffy on the inside. And the man has one on the outside. And it's fascinating, and it's an interesting, and it's part of our lives, and it feels good, and so what? But if, I mean, it's not, it's not all of life. I mean, if you're, if you're starving, if you don't have any food, if you're trying to protect your children, if you're having difficulties, you're not, you're not thinking about, you know, how you're going to satisfy yourself. Jesus coming as an example. Jesus designed the pleasure of the body. He designed the feel good of the body. Nobody ever talked to me about that part of life in a candid, wonderful way. And in the scriptures itself, God, who cares about human beings... I mean, the cool thing about God is God is the person who actually knows and loves you better than you can love yourself. And Jesus says, if you really want to get in on the work of God, connect with and attach to the one that has clearly been sent to you by heaven. So if I'm not the one that's sent to you by heaven, please find somebody and attach to them and begin teaming up and creating an honesty group with communion at the center and talk about everything. You know, it says if you have physical desires, you should be married, each one of you, because there's so much sexual desire, each one of you should have their own person. But then, I mean, look at Leviticus 20 and 21. In that passage, you find a statement. It's a statement about fathers and daughters. Go find it. It says that if a daughter is using her body, for enjoyment of various men, with no care about the covenant and what's going on in the demonic realm, that daughter is, it's literally, the daughter is a curse to her father. The daughter is an indicator of evil coming to her father's house. And the daughter should be put to sleep. In the former covenant, if a daughter is discovered... as one who is not watchful of the blood in the flesh, which creates a new human, that daughter should be put to sleep. 
because she is a disgrace to her father. Now, in my situation, my father, and I'm going to give you a preface, my father was married with four children and a pregnant wife when he got my mom pregnant. He was married with a wife and four children when he got my mother pregnant. But if you look back in his life, when he was 16, he signed on to ships during World War II. And many of his friends died because their boats were torpedoed and sunk. He was working on cargo ships for four years straight, 16, 17, 18, 19, 20. Four years he was working on cargo ships. And he told me that he was taught by the elder sailors. They told him, look, the last time we came to this port, it was a thriving city. Now it's completely bombed flat and many of the people are dead and gone. The elder sailors would say to, say to him, if you go into a town and you have a drink with a girl, remember, give Americans a good name. Treat the girl in a wonderful way. Care for her. Because you don't know if you're going to die in one of these boats tomorrow. And you don't know if she's going to be bombed to death tomorrow. So my father, as a young man, was literally trained in kind and tender, caring, lovemaking, with no conscience regarding marriage and monogamy. There's a very difficult scripture 1 Corinthians 7, verse 1 and 2, because there's so much sexual desire, because there's so much sex craziness in us, each person should have their own to go to when they have the physical desire. That's a cool statement. That's something that you need to be flowing with conversation about as your children are growing up. I mean, it's not a shameful thing. Mommy and daddy enjoy each other, and it's a wonderful part of life. Mommy and daddy need to feel good together. And so talking with the children about the feel good is really essential. I mean, I'm telling you, when I discovered a little pile of pictures of naked people, it, it increased, it increased my desire to self-gratify myself because there was a hidden thing in my life. I was not told that I was adopted. I was not told that because of the love of Christ in my dad, my daddy Al, who had been raised learning about the compassions of the scriptures in the scriptures, whose own daddy had died, which was really rough on him because he was close to his dad and he was kind of like the lonesome middle kid that didn't get as much attention. That father of mine married this woman that he knew was pregnant with somebody else's kid. But there was no honesty circle. 
there was not true ecclesia. There wasn't a group of people who were saying, isn't it a wonder, isn't it a joy that your daddy rescued you inside of your mommy's womb and that you were at the wedding because a marriage covenant is completely separate and different from the flowing of the, the life, from the enjoying of the two bodies together. If you enjoy the two bodies together, you can get a child. That's cool. Whoa, we can make a baby. If you enjoy the bodies together, you can make a baby. Great, that's cool. But if the woman is being a disgrace to her father, now we're not even talking about the men disgrace department yet. But see, when I was conceived, if I were under the former covenant, think about this. I was conceived by a guy who had a wife, four kids, and she was pregnant. And he got my mom pregnant. In the former covenant, if their relationship had been found out, both of them, would, both my father and my mother, would have been stoned to death. They would have been put to sleep and I would not have lived. The pregnancy outside of the marriage would have been terminated. And everyone in the community would have seen, oh my gosh, you know, these kids don't have a daddy because of his sexual immorality. You know, oh my gosh, you know, Mama Audrey never had a marriage and a life and, a, and children because of her sexual immorality. These are difficult things, but we're in a war. You've got to understand we're in a war. And the primary battle and no one seems eager to actually be with me and stand with me as I describe these things. No one seems eager to be in total conscience cleansing and honesty and communion with one another. I mean, it's actually fun because if you cover all the bases, you can get together with a group of people and say, does your conscience feel totally clear before God? And does your conscience feel totally clear with the other believers that you know? Or are you in a state of conflict? And I mean, oh my gosh. See, the picture that Jesus gave you might not know this. That's the, the wonderful things, three wonderful things that the men were called to do in Jesus' age. Number one, there were 14 days out of the month where you give special attention and blessing to the women in their cycle. And you honor them. And you tell the children, the man is the baby fountain, the seed of the man. We're all seed of the man. We flow out from the man. And we flow out from the man in the midst of some wonderful pleasure, in some amazing, awesome, awesome feel good. We're all the seed of the man. The men are the baby fountain, the flow with the babies. And the women, are the baby catchers. The ones who catch the babies. 
and then nurture them alive for a long period of time and then in the nursing and all of these things have to be surrounded by the honesty group the communion group that's interacting with God that's friends with God because that's the Holy of Holies now the Holy of Holies is the communion of Christ we come together and we stay as pure as our day of baptism as the as pure as the first day we were anointed with the Holy Spirit which is to say all of the flow of beauty all of the flow of beauty all of the flow of beauty was made by God for you God made your senses the spirit the highest spirit Yahweh there are many many spirits there are teeming there's an uncountable number of spirit beings there are bajillions there are an uncountable number of spirit beings and one third of them fell but that means we've got two thirds of an uncountable number of angels of light there's the Atlantic City skyline coming up we need to just get real I mean I am in relationship with all these different families because of a disrespect for Jesus one woman married a man as a business advantage when the scripture says when the Holy Spirit says if a woman is put apart from her husband she should remain unmarried <clears throat> otherwise she should be reconciled to her husband one or the other now that's two options remain unmarried or be reconciled to her husband but that is in the atmosphere of the ecclesia where you're constantly coming together with these people who are in ecstasy of the holy spirit and hungry to go out and touch and refresh another soul now if you can't see the value of blessing the women in their cycle for 14 days straight the men teaching the whole family okay boys and girls we're blessing your sister because she's in her cycle right now and she gets 14 days of extra love blessings and care okay then when your brother has released his seed he lets us know because that's our blood we are the seed that came that flowed forth from a man in the midst of some pleasure it's funny because the woman flow remember this kids the woman flow comes with a measure of discomfort the woman flow comes with a measure of discomfort and the guy flow comes surrounded by a comforting satisfying pleasure the stimulation it's really interesting think about that the flow that comes from the man comes while there is comforting stimulation and a real feel-good but the flow that comes from the woman comes in a time of dis difficulty and discomfort that's fascinating that means that the soul of the woman 
is literally nurtured by the needs of her body in a certain way. And the soul of the man, the mind, the will, and the emotions is trained by the growing up handling of his body, which is a challenge to discernment and self-control. The woman is raised learning a provisional reality. <clears throat> she learns to be cautious and to prepare for a time of relative difficulty. She has long periods of relative peace interspersed with, with shorter times of relative difficulty. This is fascinating stuff. No one in my whole life has ever taken the time to describe these things. I mean, there's a guy named Ravi Zacharias. He's a wonderful apologetics guy. You know, he's really a kingpin in the Jesus information business, right? But he wasn't operating in true Ecclesia because he was living lots and lots of sexual pleasure life, secret sexual pleasure life, at the same time that he's doing all this Jesus information. I mean, I know people who are actually not in right relationship with other disciples who are doing lots and lots of preaching and teaching. But they're not keeping their souls pure in communion with other people. And <laughs> it's a tragedy. I mean... And we're not that far away from the solution. The solution is not that difficult. It's not a thing that we naturally desire, but we can actually learn how to be the family freedom party. Let's, together, let's get together and free our, clear our consciences. Let's talk about the ways that we are still afflicted. Let's talk about the ways where there are bad spirits that come over us. I have a friend whose daddy departed from their lives. He was a very cheerful, wonderful person. And he departed from their lives. And it was such a broken-hearted tragedy for my friend. And there's a spirit of caution and mistrust in my friend. And there's also a spirit of wanting, wanting the love and comfort of a man. And both of those things battle very hard. If it seems like the family commitment is being tested or broken, her spirit gets cold. A woman desires family commitment. She wants to see who is dedicated to her. A woman wants family commitment. She wants to see who is dedicated to her. That is a place, that's a reality. But then Yeshua says, look, if you guys can be single like me, if you can walk your life single like me and somehow manage to handle your feel good and stay busy and stay focused, he said, look, I came into this world to go from town to town and literally touch as many people as possible. So we're supposed to be a communion group that's raising orphan children and gathering in crippled and hurt and abused souls and existing together with them 
as an amazing, unusual rabble of, of friends. It's a friend group. We're all in different circumstances. We're all a bunch of children of different ages and circumstances. And we all need to be unified in one spirit with one God as friend. That's the reality. We're supposed to be a bundle of disciples that is literally keeping the conversations about what Jesus taught, keeping the conversations going and constantly sending little teams out from our communion group. Sent ones, that's the whole game. Jesus is God, a human sent one into the human atmosphere. Then he makes 12 more sent ones and they go out and they're making sent ones. John 6, verse 29. Hey, Jesus, okay, yeah, we came after you because we're hungry and we know that you can multiply food and make food out of nothing. How do we get in on the work of the Father like you are in on the work of the Father? And Jesus says, connect with the one who has been supernaturally sent to you by heaven. So we are all supposed to be discerning who is my supernatural sent one. Now, my supernatural sent one was my mom. And I mean, everybody that knew my mom knew that she was totally into Jesus and the Bible. But I'm telling you, she was not taught about true Ecclesia. I never in my entire lifetime with my mom had regular honesty times that begin with the men, the male human beings, admitting the troubling spirits that are in their lives. I was trained in my youth to care for an extremely upset sister. My sister had fears and she had tantrums. And I was taught by the Holy Spirit somehow to help my sister handle her tantrums and her fears. And that caused me through my years to be an extremely friendly person to women. Now, in an extremely friendly person to women atmosphere, there is the reality, the potential reality of sexual intimacy possibly happening. And that has happened to me. I mean, I have had 